Thank you for joining us. My name is Audrey Hassan, patient liaison for the MDS Foundation, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to thank Acceleron, Krista Meyer Squibb, Jazz Novartis, and Takeda for supporting this webinar program. Please note that this is a pre recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. The live questions with answers opportunities for all participants are included at the end of this presentation. Today's presenter is Dr. Joseph McGurk, a principal investigator in more than 49 clinical trials, an author or co-author of more than 300 publications, abstracts, oral presentations, and posters. He has presented at dozens of universities and associations and is also a member of numerous cancer center committees, including blood utilization, multidisciplinary cancer, graft sources, infection prevention, and hematology bone marrow transplant disease working groups. Dr. McGurk completed his residency at Yale and his fellowship training at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, and subsequently served as Associate Director of the Yale Stem Cell Transplant Program. He currently serves as Director for the Division of Hematologic Malignancies and Cellular Therapeutics at the University of Kansas Cancer Center and holds the Endowed Shoot Spees Professorship in Hematology Oncology. He also currently serves on the American Society for Transplantation and Cellular Therapy Board of Directors as a director and chairs the Association of American Cancer Institute's National CAR-T Initiative. So with that said, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nick Girk. Good morning, uh, everyone. Thank you for being here on a weekend uh, day. I'm very grateful for the opportunity uh, to present to you uh, today on the topic, a very important topic of stem cell transplant for myelodysplastic syndrome as potentially curative therapy. Uh, my name is Dr. Joseph McGurk. I serve as professor of medicine at the University of Kansas Cancer Center and also oversee uh, the uh, bone marrow transplant and cellular therapeutics program I serve as Division Director of Hematologic Malignancies and Cellular Therapeutics. This is one of the larger transplant programs and cell therapy programs in the United States. Uh, as mentioned, uh, my intent is to uh, talk about stem cell transplantation in myelodysplastic syndrome. Uh, but before we uh, get started on that specific uh, application, uh, let's talk a little bit about myelodysplastic syndrome more generally. As many of you are well aware, Myelodysplastic syndrome is a malignant disorder. It's a cancer, and it's characterized by ineffective hematopoiesis. What that means is that the bone marrow stem cells themselves become cancerous. Genetic damage occurs in those cells, and we'll talk more about that, and gives rise uh, to poor uh, differentiation or uh, growth and uh, maturation of white blood cells that help fight infection, red blood cells that carry oxygen to your tissues, and the platelets, which are fractions or uh, parts of cells that help you stop bleeding when you cut yourself. A variable number of immature cells called leukemic blasts occurs in myelodysplastic syndrome. Now, all of us have these very immature cells called blasts in our bone marrow. Uh, however, uh, most of those blasts are normal healthy cells that are giving rise to daughter cells that will then give rise to those important white blood cells, red blood cells, and platelets that I just described. In myelodysplastic syndrome, they're not healthy normal blast. Uh, they are deranged and they don't mature properly as I mentioned. In addition, they cause a block uh, in the uh, growth and maturation phase so that they build up. In other words, patients with myelodysplastic syndrome can develop too many blasts in their bone marrow. There are not healthy uh, blasts that are giving rise to normal blood cells, and there are too many of them. The median age of myelodysplastic syndrome is 70, and 30% of these patients will be expected to progress to acute myelogenous leukemia. Now, that 30% is somewhat misleading. Many patients are of advanced age with a median age of 70, more than half the patients are greater than 70 years of age and have other comorbidities, 
and my succumb to those in that time and not have time to, uh, to uh, evolve to acute myelogenous leukemia before they die of other causes. Uh, for example, emphysema, heart disease, et cetera, the ailments uh, that we accrue as we age. However, a significant percentage of patients with myelodysplastic syndrome never evolve to an acute myelogenous leukemia because they die from complications of their myelodysplastic syndrome before they have the uh, opportunity to evolve to acute myelogenous leukemia. As I mentioned, the white blood cells that help us fight infection uh, do not mature properly. And so even when a patient has a relatively normal white blood cell count, those cells don't function in fighting infection as well as they should. And many patients not only have that defect, but they also don't have enough white blood cells. So they can have low white blood cell count numbers predisposing them to infections. In addition, patients can develop bleeding complications. Even when they have a platelet count that is normal, and most times they do not, but when they do, those, those platelets do not function properly and patients are predisposed to bleeding complications. And finally, the red blood cells don't carry oxygen as well uh, as they should. They just don't function as well. Uh, and uh, they are often deficient in numbers. In other words, patients are anemic. About 15,000 new cases are diagnosed in the United States annually, and that's thought to be an underestimate. In Canada, about 1,500 patients on a yearly basis. And the prevalence, meaning the number of patients living in a year uh, with a diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndrome, is about 35 to 55,000 and 4,500 in Canada. But here, too, there are thought to be a significant percentage of patients who are undiagnosed with myelodysplastic syndrome, but indeed have the disease, and so an un underrepresentation by these numbers. The majority of patients with myelodysplastic syndrome come to medical attention because they have fatigue and malaise uh, and are found on uh, a, an evaluation of their blood counts uh, to have moderate to severe anemia. In other words, low red blood cell numbers. Now, uh, as I mentioned, this is a disease principally of the elderly. Uh, so you can see as we age decade after decade, uh, the incidence uh, or occurrence of myelodysplastic syndrome steadily increases and peaks uh, in those of a truly advanced age that is greater than 80 years of age. That having been said, in a large uh, leukemia, bone marrow transplant, myelodysplastic syndrome like uh, ours here at Kansas uh, University Cancer Center, uh, we do see patients who are in their teens, 20s, and 30s with this disease and for whom a transplant is needed. What is the prognosis? How do we predict when we first see a patient with myelodysplastic syndrome, how likely that patient's going to do uh, well uh, over in the, the ensuing months and years? Well, that was first uh, uh, defined by the World Health Organization prognostic uh, scoring system called the WPSS uh, and the, that survival is displayed here with patients separated into uh, a number of different risk groups, six different risk groups, very low, low, intermediate, and high, very high, and then terminal differentiation into acute myelogenous leukemia that was associated with the myelodysplastic syndrome. As I described, about 30% of patients can be expected uh, to undergo this transformation to acute leukemia. And you can see that despite the advanced age of most patients with this diagnosis, those patients with very low or low risk disease generally do well over the ensuing years. And a substantial percentage of those patients can be expected to uh, be surviving beyond 10 years. The intermediate risk group uh, don't do quite as well as would be expected. And uh, although surviving for a couple, several years, most of those patients will have succumbed to their disease by five years after a diagnosis of intermediate um, or uh, high-risk disease. And those patients with very high-risk disease, and we'll talk more about what that means specifically, and certainly those patients who transform into acute leukemia have very short survival times, numbered in months uh, uh, more than years, uh, and uh, the overwhelming majority of those patients, particularly with secondary acute leukemia, but also true for those with very high-risk disease, 
uh, will succumb to their disease uh, within the first year. Now, as I mentioned uh, when we uh, uh, first talked uh, about myelodysplastic syndrome in general, all uh, cancers, including myelodysplastic syndrome, are caused by genetic abnormalities. So we all learned in high school and college about chromosomes. Those chromosomes are susceptible to injury. And as a matter of fact, there are a large number of proteins that can be thought as a machinery, basically, that detect abnormalities in the chromosomes when they get damaged by toxins in our environment, uh, radiation exposure from the sun, for example. We all accrue as we age damage to our chromosomes. And if that damage couldn't be repaired, uh, none of us would make it to advanced age. We would die from cancers or other uh, disorders caused by damaged chromosomes. And so there is this machinery that repairs these. And part of the reason patients develop myelodysplastic syndrome is because that machinery breaks down. It doesn't detect the uh, damage uh, that, that uh, has incur been uh, incurred uh, by the chromosomes or it detects it but doesn't repair it properly, uh, et cetera. All cancers are caused by genetic abnormalities, damaged chromosomes, damaged genes, without exception. No cancer is an exception to this rule. And those genetic abnormalities can be uh, 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 quite numerous uh, in cancers, particularly solid tumors like colon cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer but they also occur in myelodysplastic syndrome. And there's a spectrum of genetic abnormalities that, that can uh, occur that are actually quite specific for myelodysplastic syndrome. That spectrum of genetic abnormalities can also be classified into uh, groups that have very good genetic abnormalities to those who have good genetic abnormalities and are likely to do well if we just look at the genetic abnormalities. An intermediate group and then the most worrisome groups uh, being represented by those with particularly bad genetic abnormalities or severely uh, bad genetic abnormalities. And not, it's not just one genetic abnormality that occurs in uh, these patients. Uh, oftentimes, it can be uh, the uh, accrual of multiple genetic abnormalities called complex cytogenetic abnormalities, and those patients do particularly poorly in the long term. And so, but this information can be used to have a thoughtful conversation with your patient about uh, their prognosis, uh, their survival times, and their likelihood of responding to a therapy that you're going to discuss with them, including stem cell transplantation, but other therapies as well. And further, and very importantly, these genetic abnormalities increasingly um, are uh, being targeted with specific therapies that can go after the problem that they give rise to. So when we look at the genetic abnormalities alone, outside of the isolation of other clinical features, uh, we uh, also can develop the same type of curves that I showed you earlier in terms of those patients with very good genetic uh, abnormalities, having long survival times in the blue and the top curve to the intermediate group, and those patients with some of the poor or very poor risk genetic abnormalities that I mentioned to you, particularly complex uh, uh, cytogenetic abnormalities are entirely missing chromosomes, such as minus seven chromosome. The whole chromosome is missing. Those patients have very poor outcomes, and you can see that uh, represented in this curve as those lower two, um, uh, in, in this slide, in the, as those lower two curves, showing that the majority of patients will succumb uh, in a relatively short order after they present with that diagnosis. And so uh, the most commonly used prognostic tool is called the International Prognostic Scoring System Revised because there was an IPSS. This is now the revised IPSS. And this is more commonly used in the World Health Organization tool that I uh, uh, showed you initially and then the cytogenetic tool that I just showed you a moment ago. This combines a number of variables, this IPSS revised scoring system. Uh, very importantly, a uh, number of variables over here on the left-hand side of this slide, cytogenetics are included. And we just talked about the range of cytogenetic abnormalities from very good to good to intermediate to poor and very poor. And we assign points, as you can see up in the top line here, prognostic variable and the number of points that are assigned from zero to 0 0.51, et cetera. 
the more points a patient accrues, the worse the prognosis is uh, for that patient. A second a variable is the bone marrow blast percentage. How many of those immature cells that I described to you at the beginning of this talk are present as a percentage? Less than or equal to 2% doesn't accrue any points. However, if patients have two to less than 5%, they get a point. Those patients who have more than 5%, which is abnormal in almost all circumstances uh, as a finding in the bone marrow evaluation, uh, accrue more points, two to three uh, to four points. The, hemoglo the hemoglobin, which is a measure of uh, the number of red blood cells, an indirect measure of the number of red blood cells. So if the hemoglobin is greater than 10, no points are accrued, female or male. In contrast, if the patient is clearly anemic uh, in, in that eight to less than 10 range, they accrue a point and the more anemic they are, uh, the more uh, points that they, they will accrue to a maximum of 1.5. The platelet count, those fragments of cells that help us stop bleeding when we cut ourselves, uh, that number also um, is important in this prognostic index from patients who have platelet counts greater than 100,000, which is not normal, greater than 150,000 is normal. But if it's greater than or equal to 100,000, they accrue no points. But as they become more thrombocytopenic or have a low platelet count, uh, they uh, start accruing points to this prognostic scoring system. And finally, this ANC means absolute neutrophil count. So when we do a complete blood count, we see the white blood cell count and it, we'll get a number out of that. Most commonly on average, say, five, a number of 5.0. And that 5.0 white blood cell count is made of different parts and pieces. Lymphocytes are in there, uh, B cells are in there, T cells are in there, natural killer cells in the lymphocyte compartment. Uh, other white blood cells are in there, neutrophils, macrophages, monocytes, a variety, eosinophils, basophils. What we're most interested in this prognostic scoring system is a specific type of white blood cell called the neutrophil count. And that helps fight bacterial and fungal infections, for example. When that is greater than 0 0.8 or 800 out of the 5,000 white blood cells we're looking at, though no, no point is accrued. But if it's less than 0 0.8, a half a point is assigned to that. So all of these numbers are then brought together to uh, provide our patient with a prognostic score. As a matter of fact, you can go online. Any, uh, anyone who's attending this talk today, anyone, can go online and Google the IPSSR calculator, and it will allow you to put those variables in. As you can see, the hemoglobin level, the absolute neutrophil count, the platelet count, the blast percentage, and then the cytogenetic or genetic damage. We talked about score, uh, and then this will uh, calculate what the patient's score is, uh, and then what the patient predicted survival uh, is. It can be modified by the entry of a patient's age as well for the survival estimate. Uh, uh, estimate. So a very useful tool that uh, uh, many clinicians use uh, on a, a daily basis uh, in uh, managing their patients. And this is a, a graphic representation of what the outcomes are for patients with these uh, assigned scores based on the accrual of the points for the variables that I showed you earlier, the International Prognostic Scoring System revised. And you can see patients who have very few points, um, 0, 0 0.51, are in this very low and low risk group. And those patients uh, have the ability to do well for years. Not all of them will. Some will surprise us in six months their disease is advancing. Some will do better uh, than average. But if we put them all into uh, a group, this is what their uh, survival looks like. And that allows us to have a thoughtful conversation with the patient about our therapeutic options and their prognosis and likelihood of doing well long term. There's an intermediate risk group. And then there are those patients with high or very high uh, scores on this uh, prognostic scoring system who will do very poorly in relatively short order and have survivals, for example, median survivals of six months. So this is a very important and useful tool in talking to our patients. But the field has been moving well beyond just the variables and the prognostic scoring systems that I've shown you so far. When I showed you those cytogenetic abnormalities, those were pieces, whole pieces of chromosomes with hundreds 
of genes on that piece. So missing a whole chromosome seven, many genes are on that chromosome or, or having multiple sided genetic abnormalities, broken chromosomes rearranged, for example, or entirely missing, as I mentioned, or a 5Q minus syndrome, which is a unique syndrome, parts and pieces. But if we look more closely at those broken and deranged chromosomes, we can identify very specifically with high resolution what the specific genes, and we have thousands of genes on our chromosomes, but what are the specific genes that are the culprits in giving rise to this blood cancer, this myelodysplastic syndrome? What are, what's driving the, uh, the uh, development of myelodysplastic syndrome? And not just driving it, but what's furthering it? Because these uh, cells in myelodysplastic syndrome are not stable. They are genetically unstable. And so while the original cancer cell in a bone marrow stem cell may have one or two genetic abnormalities, the daughter cells can have four or five or six. And so they accrue more genetic abnormalities. And these genetic abnormalities have been uh, uh, defined with high resolution studies in the last decade. It's quite remarkable. And we can split them up into different uh, groups of what they do. What is their function in the in the uh, uh, nucleus, in the chromosome. As I mentioned uh, to all of you, the uh, chromosomes and the genes specifically get damaged by toxins in our environment, radiation, or some have a genetic susceptibility to accruing this damage. And there's a whole machinery. So when we learned about the double helix in chromosomes in high school and college, we saw that double helix unfolding. But that's just part of the story. That's just the core of the, uh, of the whole process. There's a cloud of proteins and all this machinery that surrounds uh, and, and encases those chromosomes and constantly are regulating the expression of genes uh, and are fixing uh, the damaged genes when they occur and, and tending to this. So it's really a remarkable world. It's kind of the awe-inspiring feeling you get when you're out in the Rocky Mountains looking up at the sky in the winter months and you see the arm of Milky Way sweeping across the sky and you think, what in the world is going on? And we see that same awe-inspiring uh, effect when we look at these genes and these chromosomes and how, how this uh, machinery regulates them. Well, the machinery can get broken or the genetic abnormalities can give rise to broken parts and pieces of the machine that are supposed to tend to the chromosomes and keep all the genes in the chromosomes in good order and active when they're supposed to be and inactive when they're not supposed to be. Things can go wrong. And they're classified here, you can see, as, and I don't expect you to understand the specifics of this, is RNA splicing, DNA methylation that regulates whether the gene is expressed or not, histone modification, which also uh, impacts regulation, DNA transcription, so turning those genes uh, into messenger RNAs and then into proteins to go and carry out some job in, in or outside of the cell. Signal transduction, how do cells talk to each other? How do cells uh, internally regulate themselves? The, a group of those types of genes and then chroma, uh, chromatid cohesion. All of these are critically important and all of these are predictive in how likely our patients are going to do well or not do so well with the therapies that we have to offer them today. And so now we're going to shift over, knowing that we have enough data to tell us prognostically how likely a patient's going to do well um, over the months and years to come. Uh, and we have more specific data in the genes that I described to you that are allowing us to target, not, uh, target more specifically the specific genetic abnormality to bring about uh, a good outcome for our patient, God willing. Um, in addition, those specific genetic abnormalities I just showed you on the last slide help tell us, is this patient gonna do okay for a while? So there are certain genetic abnormalities in the spliceosome group that I showed you that would say this patient has a pretty good prognosis. And there are others in there that, says, that tell us this patient is not gonna do well almost no matter what we do. All of that helps us figure out uh, uh, if this patient needs therapy now, and if they need therapy now, what kind of therapy do they need? And the therapies range, and we'll talk about this in my last slide in a few slides from now, the therapies range from just uh, watching the patient and not intervening at all. The patient's not 
terribly anemic yet. The blood platelet count is not uh, significant to the extent that they require platelet transfusions, and they're not yet at significant risk for infection. They need to be monitored, uh, but they don't need ther a therapeutic intervention. To therapies that are going to just help them make more red blood cells for some time or keep them out of harm's way in terms of infection or bleeding complications. To therapies that are potentially curative, and there is only one curative therapy for myeloid dysplastic syndrome that exists anywhere in the world. And that is represented in this slide by allogeneic stem cell transplant. So what is allogeneic stem cell transplant? The bone marrow is cancerous in patients with myeloid dysplastic syndrome. And so we can use intensive chemotherapy regimens to destroy that bone marrow. If we destroy the bone marrow, you can't make white blood cells to fight infection, you can't make red blood cells to carry oxygen to your tissues, and you can't make platelets to help stop yourself from bleeding. So if you destroy the cancer, you destroy the bone marrow in the process, the patient will die. So the way we get around that problem is we find a donor who mat is an appropriate match, not for their blood type, but for their immune system, which is coded for on chromosome six. So we find an appropriately matched donor based on those chromosome six genes, who's well matched in the family or the worldwide registry of unrelated donors uh, or children who are half matched or umbilical cord blood. We use that donor to rescue the patient's bone marrow failure from the chemotherapy meant to kill their cancer cells off and cure the patient. And then you grow a new immune system and new blood formation and the blood type changes to that of the donor, believe it or not. So an A blood type in the recipient, if the donor's O, that recipient's gonna become an O. If the recipient has seasonal allergies and the donor doesn't, the recipient will no longer have seasonal allergies after the bone marrow transplant. It's quite a remarkable process. Uh, now it's associated with significant risk, particularly a problem called graft versus host disease, that can occur where the donor's immune system recognizes a patient as foreign and can attack them, their skin, their liver, their intestines, and, uh, and it's a common problem after transplant. Most patients get better, uh, either don't develop it or do uh, develop it and get better with steroids, but not all, and some can actually die from complications of this graft-versus-host disease. But this process of allogeneic stem cell transplant, allogeneic just means using somebody else as a donor, whether that's an unrelated donor, matched sibling, your, one of your children, or a cord blood allogeneic donor transplant. And this is a graphic depiction of allogeneic transplants in the United States done by year. And you can see that this area of uh, curative therapy, potentially curative therapy, has grown remarkably. So the uh, upper dark blue line shows that there are many thousands of these unrelated donor transplants performed in the United States. Uh, unrelated donor transplants are used because only about 25 to 30 percent of patients uh, will have a match, perfect match in the family. So there are 20 million people in the worldwide registries willing to donate their stem cells for someone in need of a transplant to be cured of their disease. Unfortunately, uh, if you're an uh, ethnic, uh, underrepresented ethnic group, uh, such as African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Asian Americans, uh, Native Americans or mixed race couples like my own family, my wife is Chinese and I'm Caucasian and Western European descent, your chance of having either a matched sibling or a matched unrelated donor is much less than if you're Caucasian or Western European descent. And so that problem has given rise to these lower curves here. You can see the light blue uh, representation, cord blood transplant can be life-saving, but a new strategy, new being in the last 15 years, uh, 15 to 20 years has been using family members who are half matched. Your children will always be half matched with you, as will uh, many of your uh, uh, siblings and your parents will always be half matched with you. And so we can use family donors who are half matched in the Johns Hopkins uh, group and others, such as our own center, have really pioneered these strategies so that the outcomes are very similar to matched sibling and unrelated donor transplants these days these days, and so you can see remarkable growth. And many of our patients with myeloid dysplastic syndrome uh, can avail themselves of these potentially curative treatment strategies. Uh, this is a representation of the growth of our, our own transplant program, but reflective of the growth of such transplant programs across the nation uh, and throughout the world community. We do perform about uh, a, a 320 uh, transplants on average on a yearly basis. 2020 is not yet mature data, but we'll hit that mark uh, over the next several months 
uh, again. So these are commonly performed uh, therapeutic strategies in acad academic centers across the nation. The most common indications for a stem cell transplant are represented here. And in the green bars, you can see autologous transplant using your own stem cells. Well, we don't use that for myelodysplastic syndrome. No, rather in blue, you can see the reasons we use someone else, an allogeneic donor for stem cell transplantation. And the number one reason we do those uh, allogeneic transplants is for acute myelogenous leukemia. Number two indication in the United States is myelodysplastic syndrome. And there are a couple thousand of those transplants performed on a yearly basis. What's the survival? What's the likelihood that we can cure the patients? Well, these days um, uh, we take patients with intermediate and high risk disease uh, to stem cell transplant. And we hold off on stem cell transplant for those patients with very good, good um, uh, or intermediate low risk disease until they show progression or if they have particularly adverse or bad genetic abnormalities associated with their disease, uh, which I talked about several slides ago. Uh, and so when we look at allogeneic transplant for myelodysplastic syndrome in the United States, over a 10 year period, we have many thousands of patients. Uh, and remember, these patients are patients who have indications for transplant. In other words, they have aggressive high risk disease. And in those patients, uh, you can see that about 45 to 50 percent of patients are cured here with a matched sibling donor on the left hand panel. Um, if the patients come to us early, we transplant them early when their disease is just advancing. And this is an important point. Their uh, survival is better than if they come to us and they haven't been followed closely. And now they have very advanced disease. They're turning into an acute leukemia. They've had recurrent infections. We're in trouble. They're not going to do as well. In the right-hand panel are data on over 5,000 patients over that 10-year period with myelodysplastic syndrome. Again, a significant difference if they come to us early, not too early when they have a low-risk disease and are not even requiring transfusions yet, but not too late when they're evolving to acute leukemia. They come to us early as we're seeing the disease become somewhat more aggressive. We're ready to move to transplant. If we wait too long and the horse is out of the barn, we don't do as well as you can see. Uh, and we're down in the 40% long-term survival range. But those, those are plateaus. So patients uh, can achieve a normal life expectancy with allogeneic transplant. And again, this represents the only potentially curative therapy. Now, when should we do an allogeneic stem cell transplant? Uh, uh, that is a great challenge. Here on the left-hand side, if you look at the uh, uh, different scoring systems that we use, the International Prognostic Scoring System, or in the lower panel, the uh, World Health Organization prognostic scoring system, uh, in the very low or low risk patients, those patients may do well for eight or 10 years. And if you employ a transplant too early in those patients, you could potentially lose them from complications of your transplant, graft versus host disease, infectious complications, organ toxicity. Uh, and uh, if you lose the patient in the first year after you've done the transplant, and they were going to live for eight years without your transplant, you've done them a terrible disservice. Good intent, but uh, not optimal timing of a transplant. On the other hand, if we go over to the right-hand side of, this, uh, uh, of these uh, bar graphs, uh, and we wait and we don't uh, do the transplant until the patient is a secondary acute leukemia, well, we have to get that into remission. The odds are stacked against us there. If we do get it back into remission or a myelodysplastic state, we won't do as well with that patient as if we had employed the transplant earlier. Many of those patients simply won't make it to the transplant. They'll die from their disease before we can transplant them. And so there's a place in between somewhere where uh, it's the most appropriate time to employ the transplant. Now I've put my own biased uh, sampling in here. Well, I recommend that we watch our patients very closely. There's a New England Journal of Medicine article published just last week, a review of myelodysplastic syndrome, October 1st issue. And I encourage you to take a look at that, pull that up online. It's a nice summary, but I disagree with it in terms of watching counts. It recommends that blood counts be watched every six months in a bone marrow every year. I don't recommend that to our patients, even with low risk disease. I recommend they get blood counts every month in a bone marrow every six months 
so that we can catch that point where they are moving, transitioning from low risk disease to intermediate risk group, because it's my belief that that's the optimal time to employ a transplant. As a matter of fact, even for the low risk uh, disease patients, we prepare them for a transplant and find donors for them and then don't treat them with the transplant. We've got other treatment options for them. Put that information in our back pocket so that inevitably when they progress and everybody will, when they progress with their disease, you're ready and you've already vetted who the donor is going to be. If they're still available at that time, it could be years, uh, et cetera, you're ready to go with your transplant and not wait too long until the patient has more advanced disease. Now, many of my colleagues would put that arrow a little further down the line when patients are, have progressed from the intermediate one uh, group to the intermediate two risk group, uh, conferences and such. The important take home point is patients have to be watched closely and donor options have to be sorted out early on in the patient's disease process before the patient progresses. So you're ready when the patient progresses. Uh, and you're watching closely, so when they progress, you don't miss it uh, by waiting six months or a year to do another bone marrow or do blood counts, for goodness sakes. We see that all too often in our transplant program, patients diagnosed with very low or low-risk disease, and the doc and the patient have a sense of security around that, and they don't watch closely, and the patient comes to us with acute leukemia, and we can't go to transplant unless we can get their leukemia into remission. So timing is, of, uh, is essential for the well-being of our patients, with the only curative therapy being allogeneic stem cell transplant. But there are other therapies. So as mentioned, this is a graphic depiction of the article published in the New England Journal of Medicine a week ago, looking at uh, uh, the evaluation diagnostic workup of a patient who presents with abnormal blood counts. And as mentioned, that can be a low or high white blood cell count. That can be a low platelet count in myelodysplastic syndrome, or mo most commonly a low red blood cell count manifesting as anemia or that decreased hemoglobin we talked about earlier. Uh, and then we do diagnostic procedures. We look at their uh, blood cells under the microscope. We do a bone marrow evaluation. We look at the percentage of immature cells in that bone marrow. We look at the genetic abnormalities and we do what's called next generation sequencing and look at those specific gene abnormalities that I described to you earlier. There will be some patients who have cytopenias of unknown significance that are clonal. What does that mean? Well, you, you can have anemia and look at the red blood cells that lead up, uh, the, the cells that lead up to red blood cell production and uh, see that those cells are, they're, they're, they're just not, uh, growing up and maturing properly because there's not enough iron, for example. On the other hand, we can look at them and say, there's a genetic abnormality in this cell. That's clonal. That means that that cell has a genetic abnormality and that cell is behaving like a low grade, low level cancer and warrants follow up. But you just watch those patients because they don't have what re is required to define them as myelodysplastic syndrome. And that is having these unique genetic abnormalities I described to you. Um, or having uh, a, a cytogenetic abnormalities, or having uh, a one or greater of the cell lines not maturing properly, called dyspoiesis. And the cell lines, remember, are the red blood cell lines, the white blood cell lines, and the platelet cell lines. Once the patient has that diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndrome, then it's critically important to assess those patients for eligibility for allogeneic transplant. And if you look at a lot of articles or open a textbook, it'll say transplant uh, is applicable only to a minority of patients because older patients have multiple comorbidities um, or they're greater than 70 years of age. Well, that's unfair because there are 40 year olds who are very unfit and have comorbidities because they haven't taken care of themselves and they drank and smoked, uh, et cetera. And there are 75 year olds who are running marathons still. Uh, and uh, so that 75 year old may do better with transplant than that 40 year old who smokes and drinks and has done illicit drugs and such and is in worse shape than that 75 year old who's running all the time. So we really look at physiologic fitness rather than an isolated or arbitrary age of a patient uh, for, uh, for undergoing stem cell transplant. So assessment for allogeneic transplant. And if eligible, the patient should proceed to allogeneic stem cell transplant at some time point. 
Not necessarily when they're first diagnosed, uh, diagnosed if they're in that very low or low risk group, it may not even be requiring therapy for the reasons I described to you in the last slide. On the other hand, not waiting too long and watching them closely so that they don't evolve into acute leukemia and now the horse is out of the barn. And some patients will be ineligible uh, because of uh, multiple medical problems they have or preference. For those patients, they should be considered for clinical trial participation or medical therapy. And there are a range of medical therapies currently avail available. In the lower risk patients, surveillance, watching their blood counts, providing transfusion support as, ne as necessary. Uh, erythropoiesis stimulating agents. These are agents that stimulate red blood cell growth. Uh, uh, lenalidomide, which is an immunomodulatory drug and is used in myelodysplastic syndrome, particularly in a disorder called the isolated deleted 5Q. And those patients can have a good response, often lost, uh, that, that response is lost and the disease progresses after two to three years uh, in patients. Luzpatercept, just recently approved by the Food and Drug Administration in myelodysplastic syndrome in patients with ring sideroblast, decreasing transfusion needs. Immunosuppressive therapy in patients who have, most patients with bone marrow with myelodysplastic syndrome have too many cells, what's called a hypercellular bone marrow. Some, a small percentage have hypoplastic or there aren't enough cells in the bone marrow. And a, a subset of those will respond to drugs that suppress the immune system. Red blood cell transfusions, oftentimes coupled with iron chelation, because when you give somebody a red blood cell transfusion, they don't have a way to get rid of that iron unless they're bleeding. A menstruating woman, of course, would be able to get rid of the iron, but uh, uh, a menopausal woman or a man would not be able to get rid of the iron. And it, that iron becomes deposited in the liver and other organs, the kidneys and the heart, and can cause organ damage. So iron chelation medications that get rid of that iron while being able to provide red blood cell transfusion safely to our patients. That's the low risk group. And then the higher risk group, hypomethylating agents too, azocytidine and decitabine. Azocytidine has been shown to improve overall survival in patients, not by years, but rather by months. Uh, and only about 50% of patients will respond uh, to that. Some, a small subset will have a complete response, however. Intensive chemotherapy for those patients who have acute myelogenous leukemia, but I would argue that if they can tolerate intensive chemotherapy, they should have been over on that eligible for allogeneic transplant group consideration in the first place. And then targeted therapies at those genetic abnormalities that are evolving in research stages. And then finally, for some patients, supportive care alone, transfusions, antibiotics when they get an infection, et cetera. So that is my view on the role of allogeneic stem cell transplant. Again, a potentially curative therapy, uh, but a very complex procedure with associated risk. And so selection, timing, uh, and choosing uh, the right team to perform that transplant, all critically important variables. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, and again, for taking time out of your precious weekends uh, to hear about myelodysplastic syndrome. I'm glad now to answer any questions that you may have. Um, our first question comes from Phil. He wants to know what your insight is on double cord blood transplant and can it be curative? Yes, uh, double cord blood transplant can be curative. Uh, we um, have recently published the results of uh, double uh, cord blood transplant versus haploidentical mismatched family donor transplant. And I uh, served as one of the co-authors on that manuscript published recently in the journal Blood, uh, prospective uh, randomized trial of haploidentical versus double umbilical cord blood transplant. And um, these strategies have increased access uh, for patients uh, to transplant, particularly underrepresented uh, uh, ethnic populations. So for example, uh, the majority of patients as mentioned uh, who are in need of a potentially curative allogeneic transplant will not have a brother or sister who's a perfect match. Only about 25% of patients will. And that's given uh, rise to the uh, worldwide registry of unrelated donors. About 25 million people now willing to donate their stem cells for a patient in need of a potentially curative transplant. But uh, if you're a Caucasian of Western European descent, your chance of having a match in the worldwide registry, about 75%. In contrast, if you're African-American, Asian-American, Hispanic-American, Native American, 
or mixed race couple, uh, your chance of having a match in the registry is much less. And so being able to use family members who are partially matched called haploidentical stem cell transplants, your children, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, or, uh, or your parents or a sibling, uh, or using a umbilical cord blood transplant um, has come to the forefront. And there's, uh, we have data in the medical literature that I and others have published that demonstrates that these alternative donor transplant strategies, including double, double umbilical cord blood transplant, have increased access for patients in need of transplant. Thank you, Dr. McGurk, very thorough answer. The next question comes from Peggy. She's concerned about dangerous to lethal black box warnings around some EPS agents, reticrit. Can these side effects worsen the course of the MDS in that patient and how do you determine that? She's asked a question that is beyond my knowledge and education base. Um, so uh, was that a EPO, did she say? Actually, she typed an EPS, and then she put in parentheses reticrit, R-E-T-A-C-R-I-T. So I think she's talking about erythropoietin agents. Um, and so I can just comment uh, briefly about erythropoietin stimulating agents. Um, erythropoietin stimulating agents are a mainstay of um, a therapy for patients uh, requiring transfusion support in myeloid dysplastic syndrome. So low risk patients, for example, who are requiring some transfusion support, erythropoietin st uh, stimulating agents are an appropriate treatment strategy. However, there are black, black box warnings um, uh, uh, not with regard to stimulation of the myelodysplastic syndrome uh, 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 per se, but rather uh, their um, uh, ability, if you administer those uh, to patients, particularly those with a hematic crit of 10 or greater, uh, they put them at increased risk for blood clot formation, worse outcomes in general. Um, but I don't, I'm a transplant physician and uh, so, I, I don't actually manage uh, patients with uh, low risk disease other than to prepare them for uh, a future transplant. And they're managed by their uh, um, he, uh, hematologist oncologist who focuses or specializes in myelodysplastic syndrome. So I think it's a better question for uh, more knowledgeable people about the erythropoietin stimulating agents than I am. Thank you, Dr. McGurk. Next question is, which is less risky, a double cord transplant or a donor transplant? Well, a double cord blood transplant is a donor transplant. Um, and so I think uh, the uh, questioner uh, uh, means to ask is, um, uh, is the double umbilical cord blood transplant uh, more risky um, or not than a sibling, perfect match sibling or unrelated donor? And the answer to that appears to be yes, at least particularly in the first several months. Um, there are some data uh, that have been published, for example, by an investigator at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, Julia Barker, uh, that um, suggests that uh, outcomes uh, in uh, her uh, team's hands uh, are similar to that that uh, is seen with unrelated donor transplantation. There are other data that suggest that uh, the outcomes of uh, double umbilical cord blood transplant uh, in terms of the transplant related uh, morbidity and mortality, uh, risk of dying from complications of the transplant are greater without double umbilical cord blood transplant compared to uh, a matched sibling donor or matched unrelated donor and more, more uh, consistent with a mismatched unrelated donor uh, transplant, which uh, has a higher uh, mortality rate than a perfectly matched unrelated donor transplant. The trial that I mentioned that I co-authored with others uh, that's published in blood now on double umbilical cord blood transplant versus mismatched family donor transplants, haploidentical transplants, did demonstrate a uh, higher uh, risk associated with double umbilical cord blood transplant and a better survival for patients having haploidentical stem cell transplant. We are looking for uh, other strategies with umbilical cord blood transplants, such as expansion of the cord blood stem cells, so we don't have to use two cord blood units. Using two cord blood units, or so-called double umbilical cord blood transplants, are associated with greater risk 
or graft versus host disease. Uh, and that is a common cause of illness and sometimes death after transplant. Uh, and so if we could use a single cord blood, but have enough stem cells, and that's the challenge because this is coming from a baby and going into an adult and the number of stem cells is problematic. We participated in a prospective randomized trial, not yet published, of uh, single versus double umbilical cord blood transplant, the single cord blood unit being a genetic, uh, genetically modified uh, and stimulated to expand um, uh, and, and then uh, administering that to patients. Uh, and we await the results of that important study, but we're hopeful uh, that that's going to be represent an advance in the field. So um, as I've mentioned in, uh, in my presentation, uh, all allogenic stem cell transplants have challenges associated with them, have the risk of graft versus host disease, infectious complications, organ toxicity from chemotherapy and or radiation therapy. Um, but uh, they are, so our preference uh, in the United States uh, currently is a matched sibling donor is their first choice if available and fit. A uh, matched unrelated donor is our second line choice. And then uh, alternative donor, haploidentical versus unrelated donor uh, 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 or umbilical cord blood transplant. Uh, and that, that's kind of how many centers uh, stack that up. Now, investigators who focus their efforts into any one of those individual areas, um, uh, such as haploidentical stem cell transplants at Johns Hopkins and at our center, umbilical cord blood transplants at Duke and Memorial Sloan Kettering and University of Minnesota, um, will argue how that sh should be, match sibling donor uh, and a match unrelated donor or double umbilical cord blood transplant or uh, mismatch family donor transplant. One of the challenges with, challenges with unrelated donor transplant is that even if you have a, a graft that's available, uh, you've got a perfect match out there, there is a chance that uh, your disease will progress uh, in the time that it takes logistically to arrange for that transplant. Now, the National Marrow Donor Program has gone a long way in the last few years to expedite that and improve it, but still, it can take many weeks to access a donor. And during that time, patients are at risk for relapse. And so, a significant minority of patients who have a match in the unrelated donor registry will die from their disease before they ever get to the transplant. Um, and so, uh, so if you have a readily available, well-matched unrelated donor, it's our center's recommendation that that be the preferred uh, strategy for patients outside of the context of a clinical trial. Um, but if, that, uh, if you have a perfect match in the unrelated donor registry, but it's going to take eight weeks, for example, or more, uh, then we'll go with a cord blood or mismatched haploidentical transplant. Thank you, Dr. Hager. That was a very thorough answer. Uh, the next question comes from Elizabeth, and she'd like you to talk a bit about the actual transplant process. Uh, the transplant process is dependent on the type of transplant being performed, the age of the patient, uh, and the disease for which you're transplanting them. Now, in the context of mild dysplastic syndrome, we uh, try to use, uh, we don't use, um, well, we do use radiation in some what are called non-myeloidive non or reduced intensity conditioning regimens, for example, for mismatched family donor transplants, but not full intensive radiation chemotherapy, which we use for some acute leukemia as a chemovascular leukemia, for example. Uh, and so uh, the, uh, the, the process with myelodysplastic syndrome uh, for the younger patients, uh, younger being defined as those 60 years of age and less, who are fit, is to give them intensive, very intensive chemotherapy over the week before the stem cell transplant occurs. We do a, an extensive evaluation before the transplant to make sure that their heart, lungs, kidneys, liver are in good condition, that they don't have active infection, that they have the family support that they need to help take care of them through the transplant process because it's a a, a many month process after transplant um, and there are hidden dangers and so they require a lot of follow up. Those all all of those things line up. We give them intensive chemotherapy. The more intensive regimens have been demonstrated to decrease the risk for relapse after transplant, but it does increase the toxicity. Uh, but for those younger patients, that's our recommendation. 
They receive that intensive chemotherapy. That stem cells are collected from the donor. They're infused like a blood transfu transfusion. They sweep through the bloodstream, lodge, and start growing in the bone marrow and repopulate all the blood elements in the immune system. The blood type changes to that of the donor. The immune system entirely changes to that of the donor. So if the donor has seasonal allergies and you don't, you may now have seasonal allergies. If they have a peanut allergy, uh, and you don't, you're going to get their peanut allergy. And so it's quite remarkable. It's an organ transplant. Your bone marrow is a complex organ. It's liquid and it moves around, but it's a very complex organ. And so, and then patients receive medications for several months, most commonly, after the transplant to prevent the immune system, even though it may well be well matched, prevent that immune system from recognizing the patient as foreign and attacking them. That's called graft versus host disease. And this is a common cause of illness and sometimes death, as I mentioned. We use those drugs. Now, those are the same drugs that are used for a heart transplant, lung transplant recipient. But the heart and lung transplant recipient have to stay on those drugs for the rest of their life. Most of our patients, we can get rid of those drugs in several months because we can actually trick the immune system of the donor into thinking it actually belongs in the patient. Uh, and that's called establishing a state of tolerance. And it's good to get rid of those drugs when we can safely do that because those drugs have a lot of toxicities associated with them. And then once we've gotten to that phase and we've gotten through the first several months, uh, we, it takes time for the immune system to fully recover. So patients have to still be monitored for risk for infection, uh, for graft versus host disease, and for uh, relapse of the disease, which can occur after these transplants as well. Now, for the older patients, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, uh, the median age for patients with myelosarcoma syndrome is 70, uh, so more than half uh, or half the patients are greater than 70 years of age, and we transplant patients up into their uh, mid to late 70s with uh, stem cell trans, uh, donors. Um, however, we can't use that full intensity conditioning regimen that we would use in the younger population of patients. So we do a reduced intensity, we call, uh, type of preparative regimen, better tolerated by the patient. That is associated with a potential greater risk for relapse after transplant, but less toxicity from the transplant itself. And so uh, those outcomes uh, actually uh, can be quite good. What is curative about these stem cell transplants isn't so much the chemotherapy as it is the immune system of the donor. Cells called T cells, which are the conductors of the orchestra in the immune system, and cells called natural killer cells can recognize any leftover cancer cells after the transplant attack and destroy them. That's called graft versus mild dysplastic syndrome, and it's very potent. So, um, uh, so, so we want to get off those immunosuppressive, uh, immunosuppressive drugs that I mentioned also to unleash the uh, donor T cells and natural killer cells so they can do their work in getting rid of any bad guys that, uh, that the chemotherapy didn't get rid of. Thank you. The next question comes from Denise. She wants to know what are the survival rates for someone who has NDS, NPN, unclassified? Uh, it depends. Uh, again, uh, the, all of this depends, of course, on the individual patient. How fit are they? What type of donor do they have? Uh, and uh, how advanced is their disease? Um, uh, those are really important variables. But in general, uh, if we look at um, uh, thousands of patients, as I demonstrated to you in the slide from the Center for International Blood Marrow Transplant Research, there were thousands of patients in that slide. Uh, that if patients come to us relatively early in their disease process, but not we don't transplant them too early, as I explained earlier, if they come early and they are not infected and they haven't evolved to acute leukemia and we transplant them, uh, we can uh, uh, cure about 45 to 50 percent of those patients. Um, and so uh, that's, uh, that's uh, quite significant. It's not good enough, but it's a lot better than zero percent. Uh, and it's 0% without transplant, 0% uh, chance that you can cure the patient. There is no other curative therapy. But again, there are variables that feed into that equation in terms of patient age, fitness, uh, any comorbidities, uh, or other illnesses that they have, what, um, how advanced is their myelodysplastic syndrome, what are the cytogenetic abnormalities associated with the disease, what type of donor do we have, so a lot of important variables. And actually, there is a mathematical formula that we use called the Center for, Interna uh, the Center for International Blood Marrow Transplant Research Survival Calculator. And we plug all that, a bunch of that data into it, and it'll tell us what is the likelihood that this patient is going to be alive at one year after transplant. And we share that specifically with our patients. Thank you. 
Great answer, thank you. The next question is from Peter. He says, my understanding is that the IPSS score and projected outcomes are for patients that are not being treated. So he wants to know if that's correct. And does the IPSS scores continue to have value during treatment? That's a great question. Um, and so, yes, the our IPSS, the revised international prognostic scoring system, uh, is for patients at time of diagnosis. Uh, now, uh, is it uh, applicable at all times going forward uh, in patients if you reapply it? Uh, yeah, it probably has utility in that setting, but it's developed at, uh, for patients at the time of diagnosis. One uh, can obviously expect that when you're first diagnosed, if you're diagnosed with low risk or very low risk disease, uh, but now you're starting to pick up uh, lower blood counts, some immature cells blast in the bone, uh, in the, more in the bone marrow or in the blood, uh, and new genetic abnormalities that you're not going to do. Uh, the, the, the original score that you had is not going to be the same uh, when you start developing those abnormalities. Things are going to be worse. And so now the disease is on the move and your prognosis is just significantly worsened. The trajectory has changed. And that happens to 100% uh, uh, of patients with myelodysplastic syndrome uh, unless they succumb to some, something else such as heart disease or um, uh, lung issues, et cetera, because this is most uh, uh, significantly an older population, patients who have other illnesses as well. But if it's just mild dysplastic syndrome, it's going to progress. And so patients have to be monitored carefully uh, for that progression. I just saw a patient uh, in my clinic yesterday who I saw about six months ago, five or six months ago now, who had a very low risk disease, didn't need any transfusions, uh, and uh, had a, a median survival predicted of eight months. Uh, and then he came to me about uh, four or five weeks ago, his doc sent him back to me because all of a sudden his blood counts were, but when we do the calculation, everything looks good. This is your median survival. We keep an eye on you and hopefully we won't, we won't see you in the near future. But we did see him in the near future because his disease rapidly progressed. He had 10% blast in his bone marrow uh, and uh, a new cytogenetic abnormality. Well, we just diagnosed him uh, several months ago and with low, uh, uh, a very low risk disease. Uh, and so uh, the calculators in, uh, such as RIPSS are helpful guides. And they help us uh, uh, risk stratify our patients so that we can talk about prognosis, we can talk about therapeutic options, when they should be employed. And as I mentioned, the, uh, the real tricky balance of uh, figuring out when to uh, recommend a transplant to a patient not too soon, uh, if they have really very good risk disease, not too late be, uh, before it's not gonna do them any good anymore and finding that important uh, uh, place. When patients like to start progressing, that's it. Uh, uh, they, we know that eight years just went out the window. Their median survival is now starting to look like six months. We better find a donor quickly and get the show on the road here. Um, and so I think that the factors that go into the RIPSS um, are, are still are relevant in patients uh, if they're, uh, where they have initially a very good uh, uh, risk disease or, or low risk disease. Uh, and then uh, 12 months later, they have new abnormalities and things are lower. The, the degree of cytopenias, the immature cells blast, the cytogenetic abnormalities in their complexity, the genetic abnormalities specifically that we talked about uh, on the next generation sequencing, uh, the fitness of the patient, all of that goes into, uh, and the age of the patient, all of that goes in. Uh, is still very relevant uh, um, at later time points. So I think that the RIPSS is uh, applicable and relevant in patients uh, in a, a, con a constant manner as they go through their uh, course of evolution of their underlying disease. Thank you for that expl explanation. The next question is, in the stem cell transplantation process, how isolated do you have to be for how long before your immune system is restored enough to go out and have a good quality of life? The most uh, uh, challenging time for our patients uh, uh, is the first month because uh, they really are the boy or the girl in the bubble. We've destroyed their immune system entirely and we're replacing it with a foreign immune system and then we're gonna keep that foreign immune system in check with our drugs to prevent graft foot disease for some time period. That new uh, immune system from their donor uh, will have to mature uh, in the patient. 
Uh, and so it, uh, that first month is the most critical time. But even beyond that, uh, they have immunodeficiency. They're particularly susceptible to infections, in particular viral infections in the community, influenza, parainfluenza, respiratory syncytial virus, and now COVID, of course, we have to contend with in our patient population. Uh, and so we teach them, uh, they're in the hospital uh, for the uh, uh, first month uh, in a transplant unit, in a protected bubble, uh, basically, if you will, with special filtration devices and, and, and water filters, et cetera, to protect them. But then they have to, then they go uh, home or locally. Uh, most centers in the country, including our own, require patients to stay with, in, uh, within 30 minutes of our hospital for 100 days after transplant. We have local lodging arranged for them. Our clinic is open seven days a week. And that first 100 days is challenging, including with regard to infectious complications. Um, if the patient doesn't develop graft-versus-host disease uh, and we're tapering or starting to take off those immunosuppressive drugs, our patients become less and less vulnerable as time goes along. And most people are able to go back to school or go back to work um, uh, at four to six months after transplant, but not everybody. And so it depends on the individual um, uh, and whether they have graft versus host disease and if we've been able to get them off of the immunosuppression uh, and their age, because uh, uh, the immune system, particularly the T cells, uh, take longer to reconstitute the older we are. Thank you. The next question is from a low risk, rares patient on blood thinner eloquence, and they want to know if there's any contraindications. To, uh, to eloquence, to the uh, oral blood thinner eloquence? Yes, no, and being no, a low risk MDS. In a low risk patient, uh, without significant thrombocytopenia, and we use, and uh, I, you know, uh, our institutional standard is 50,000, uh, and uh, we will keep them on their blood thinners until their platelet count uh, is 50,000 or less. Um, but it depends on the individual. So if someone is frail and at risk for falling, uh, their uh, um, physician may think differently and say, you know, it, the, the risk of you falling and bleeding outweighs the benefit even with a platelet count that's normal or it's only slightly low. So again, uh, it depends somewhat on the individual, but if you throw everybody into a kettle, uh, we keep people who need to be on a blood thinner for atrial fibrillation or blood clot. Uh, uh, and, uh, we keep them on that unless their platelet count is less than 50,000. Great, the next question is, is there any link between parvovirus or COVID causing MDS? Causing MDS, not that I'm aware of. I, I'm not aware that there are any data to support that. The next question is from Maureen. She's been told that her chances of a good outcome from stem cell transplant is 20% only. That means 100% curative with good quality of life. In 80% of cases, you will have uh, curative with good quality of life. In 80% of cases, you will have complications that affect your quality of life significantly. And do you agree? Um, I, it, uh, it de depends again very much. I think it's a, that's a blanket statement, uh, but, uh, but it's an important point that I think that the statement suggests. And that is um, we ultimately, if we look at a patient after transplant at one year, and we want uh, to, uh, we want to, uh, we, we, the patient needs to be alive at one year and nothing matters if they're not alive. So well, the, the important questions are, what's the chance of being alive at one year after transplant? The CIBMTR calculator allows us to uh, get a ballpark figure on that. Now, being alive at one year um, and being alive at one year without myelodysplastic syndrome are two potentially different things. You can be alive at one year uh, without myelodysplastic syndrome, uh, and that's what we're trying to achieve. But you can also be alive at one year and still surviving with myelodysplastic syndrome that relapsed after the transplant. In addition, being alive at one year without graft versus host disease is our goal, right? We don't want this complication and still on drugs that suppress the immune system. So we really want three things. We want to be alive at one year. One year is a marker. That doesn't mean that's how long you're going to survive. That's a marker that you're going to do well long term. So you're alive at one year, that's good. You're alive at one year without myelodysplastic syndrome, that's better. You're alive at one year without myelodysplastic syndrome and without graft versus host disease, that's even better. 
What's the chance of that outcome in general? About 33%. It's not in the 20s. It's about 33%. Um, but again, we have to be careful because it depends on the individual patient. Thank you. And a lot of, and a lot of transplant variables, like the type of donor, age of patient, comorbidities, uh, et cetera. Thank you, Dr. McGurk. Can you comment on the role of low intensity mini allo stem cell transplant in MDS patients? Well, that's what I was uh, uh, describing earlier, the reduced intensity conditioning regimens for the older population of patients with mild dysplasia syndrome. So those in general, greater than 60 years of age, will use, and our center is, uh, as will many of our colleagues throughout the country, um, a uh, reduced intensity or non-myeloablative, um, which means uh, that the bone marrow will recover, uh, would recover after that chemotherapy exposure. And we do use, uh, we use more reduced intensity conditioning or non-myeloablative regimens in our MDS patients than we do the full court press and maximally intensive chemotherapy regimens, just because this is a disease of the older population in general, but I have 18 year olds uh, that we uh, are taking care of with myelodysplastic syndrome and who require transplants. You saw that there, that's very rare, but all we see are rare diseases. And so we have patients in their, uh, in, in their late teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, all the way up. We use fully ablative uh, therapy in those patients, but we do use the reduced intensity or non myelolytic regimens in the older patients. Thank you. The next question is, what do you feel the effects of stress is on the progression of MDS? Well, I don't know for sure, except that in general, stress is not a good thing. I think that when you're stressed, you release a, a myriad number of molecules and steroids, and internal steroids produced by the adrenal glands uh, and that um, uh, have downstream effects. Uh, and uh, I think in and I'm confident that there's a very important link between uh, the uh, uh, immune system uh, and stress hormones and, and other molecules associated with stress. Uh, and so stress is in general not a good thing. Uh, and I, I think that there are, uh, there are increasing data to suggest that it compromises immunity. Um, so, uh, so seize the day and try not to get worked up about silly things like somebody cutting you off in traffic or getting a dent in the car or uh, some numbskull uh, not taking care of the billing uh, for your telephone service. So those things really don't count. It's a short life that we have on this uh, uh, planet if we live into our mid-90s. And it's really critically important not to wish your days away. I tell my nurses and doctors and my patients, if they say, I can't wait till Friday, I say, wait till Friday, enjoy today. Um, and, and, uh, and, and it's all going to go by too quickly. So uh, I think that uh, try to make a positive difference in the world and chill out. Thank you, Dr. McCarr. Great words to live by. The next question is, what do you, oh, I'm so sorry. The next question is, do you perform a second allo transplant in a patient relapsing after the first transplant? Well, we do, but that's quite unusual. Patients have to be very fit. They have to have relapsed far out from their first transplant. Um, I have a patient right now who's just now 70 years of age who was in complete remission for four years and uh, remarkably relapsed. It's quite rare to relapse that far out from a uh, transplant. And so we did uh, uh, just com uh, completed, he's now about 110 days out from his second transplant, but uh, he was he's a very fit 70 year old, taking good care of himself, he has very loving supportive family. And so it was a reasonable calculated risk. He's doing great, he's in remission, he's 100% of his blood and his immune system is donor derived and he doesn't have graft versus disease. But those are extremely high risk transplants Thank you. The, the next question is, how does using a child as a donor versus using an unrelated donor affect the success, success rates for transplants? So, and that, that goes back to the haploidentical uh, transplant that I mentioned earlier. So that uh, your children will be half matched with you as will your parents. 
uh, uh, and uh, half your SIBs will be half matched with you. And we do those transplants. They're called haploidentical transplants. Uh, and uh, the, those types of transplants uh, um, uh, are associated with actually uh, uh, increasingly very good outcomes and uh, approaching the results with a perfectly matched unrelated donor transplant. Uh, so I, it's, it's a very promising time. Uh, I, you know, we, I, I, again, we have a tendency to prioritize matched SEBs and matched unrelated donor uh, over uh, haploidentical or cord blood transplant, but haploidentical transplant uh, in our center and the Hopkins group, uh, for example, uh, the results are, are very comparable to the results that we're seeing with uh, well-matched unrelated donors as well. So it's a very viable option. Thank you. The next question is from Peggy. She wants to know if you can use the umbilical cord transplant from a pregnant daughter. <laughs> Uh, you can. Uh, uh, it's uh, yes, yeah, uh, you can. Uh, now there are uh, companies that will. Uh, there, there are two things. One, there are cord blood banks registries uh, where cord bloods are donated to the registry uh, and um, uh, uh, and available to us, so that we can get our. Um, this uh, thing is sending me some messages. Uh, so that we can uh, get a, a cord blood in a timely manner for a patient who's in need of a transplant. Um, now, uh, uh, with regard to a, a grandchild uh, and collecting their umbilical cord, uh, it, it really depends on matching because if the, da the daughter only has half of a parent's uh, 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 genes that code for the immune system, the other half from the other parent. And so if it's, if the baby, if the child that the daughter is carrying is pregnant with has the half that came from uh, the father, but it's the mother in need of a transplant. Uh, and then that uh, a, a, a daughter marries somebody who doesn't have any match with anybody in the family, that umbilical cord blood is not going to be an appropriate stem cell source for the grandmother. So, uh, so, or, uh, so it does. So it depends. It's po it's possible. Yes, that it it could be utilized, but it depends on uh, the inheritance pattern. Thank you. The next question is from Kim. She was diagnosed with low risk NDS rares, and she has had no transfusions, but her ferritin is at seven hundred and fifty six, and she wants to know why. Her ferritin is that high. Um, I think that that's a really important uh, uh, question, and, and um, we, uh, for her uh, primary hematologist oncologist, there are a number of reasons why the ferritin can be elevated. Ferritin is what's called an acute phase reactant, uh, so it is a reflection of iron stores, but it's also in any inflammatory state. Um, uh, so people with autoimmune disorders, people with active infections, a whole myriad, long list of medical problems can cause the ferritin to be elevated. And so I think that that, that requires a differential diagnosis and evaluation by her primary care doctor. Thank you. So, and, she, and as a follow-up, she wanted to know if she should have another bone marrow biopsy done. The last one was three years ago. Um, so I, uh, referenced, uh, 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 to you all in my talk, the article published in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, a week and a half ago now on myelodysplastic syndrome. It's a wonderful review. Uh, and uh, I, the one, there, there are two things that I, uh, well, one thing most importantly that I disagree with with that article. That article suggests that patients have a yearly bone marrow. I don't think that's frequently enough. I think in the low risk patients, uh, six uh, bone marrow uh, in our center, uh, we recommend a bone marrow every six months in the low risk patients. Um, and we recommend blood counts every month. Uh, the New England Journal of Medicine article is a little bit more liberal on spreading that out. I don't like that. I don't trust it. And the reason all of the article is beautifully written and it's uh, very uh, informative, but I don't agree with that. I think that that's uh, too, too uh, loosey goosey. Um, patients with low risk disease will absolutely progress. Uh, and you don't want to miss that progression. You wait six months to check another blood count and uh, the patient uh, at three months, 
before you have that six month appointment shows up in the emergency room with nosebleed that won't stop and a hemoglobin of seven and everything has gone haywire and you miss the window. So this is really particularly important for people who would be eligible potentially for a transplant. So our center's recommendation is a blood count every uh, month uh, and a bone marrow evaluation every six months. Thank you. Great advice. Uh, the next question is, can you talk a little bit more about what a mini transplant is? Uh, what a mini transplant is? Yes. That's another term. That's a lay terminology for what we were discussing uh, earlier with non myeloid later or reduced intensity conditioning regimens. The same thing. It's just a different nomenclature by the lay public. Thank you. Uh, the next question has to do with genetic mutations. This patient has an FF, I'm sorry, I'll say it over again, NF1 and mm -hmm. ARID18. And she is transfusion dependent, and she wants to know if this is a rare genetic mutation. Um, the it, uh, it is. Uh, I don't know about the second mutation uh, and its relevance. Uh, there are many mutations that we see that we don't quite uh, fully understand yet. I grouped the mutations um, uh, in my uh, next generation sequencing slide. Uh, if you look back at that into different components of the machinery around the chromosomes and the gene expression um, machine, uh, the, the, that machinery. Uh, and, uh, and in the New England Journal of Medicine article, rather than address her specific genetic abnormalities uh, that she just uh, that has been described, I would reference that article for the most relevant, important genetic abnormalities that have been uh, defined in myelodysplastic syndrome. Um, so I, I, I take a look at that. Thank you, Dr. McGurk. That's all the time that we have for questions. I want to thank you so much, Dr. McGurk, for your wonderful presentation and your time. Thank you. That's all the time that we have for questions. For those of you who still have questions, please feel free to reach out to me at ahassan at mds-foundation.org. If you missed out or would like to revisit this webinar, be on the lookout for an email that will provide you with the link within four to seven business days. On behalf of the MDS Foundation, thank you for joining us. This concludes today's program.